Thank you so much for joining us today, and please join me in welcoming our speaker, Michelle Finnamore. Okay, thank you, Kristen, for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for coming. I'm really delighted that you're here to hear a little bit more about Frida Kahlo as a fashion icon. Um, so I am the curator of 20th and 21st century arts, so that is my specialty, and I'm going to try to kind of look at Frida through the lens of her garments, um, and I'm going to throw a little bit of film in there too because I like film. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so the esteemed Mexican writer Carlos Fuentes encountered Frida Kahlo only once in his lifetime, but the memory stayed with him. Um, he wrote, I only saw Frida Kahlo once, but first I heard her. At a concert at the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico City, which you see here, Kahlo entered this, quote, Italianate mausoleum in white marble fashioned in the purest wedding cake style. The interior was adorned with bold and colorful murals by Jose Clemente Orozco, David Alfaro Siquieros, and Diego Rivera, Frida's husband. But all of this paled in comparison when Frida entered the box on the second tier of the theater. The jangling of her sumptuous jewelry drowned out the sounds of the orchestra. <laughs> and he writes, it was the entrance of an Aztec goddess, a Christmas tree, a pinata, more like a broken Cleopatra, hiding her tortured body, her shriveled leg, her broken foot, her orthopedic corset under the spectacular finery of the peasant women of Mexico. Frida Kahlo showing us all that suffering could not wither, nor sickness stale her infinite variety. She upstaged everything and everybody. Um, when Frida Kahlo died in 1954, her obituary in the New York Times read, Frida Kahlo, artist, Diego Rivera's wife. So she was originally known as Diego Rivera's wife, and certainly in her own day. But I think now we are pretty, um, we can very safely say that she has eclipsed Diego as a pop culture and visual icon. Um, so if you go to Google and you type in Frida, you don't even have to type in Kahlo, you will get a plethora of images of everyday people dressed up as Frida Kahlo. Um, they've taken on this persona and they've run with it. And it's really amazing and remarkable what the range is from that little girl in the front center who's just adorable to um, people from all walks of life. And then this contemporary artist, uh, Christina Gallo, who actually depicted the late Amy Winehouse as Frida Kahlo in the image um, on the upper left. Um, so. In, in some ways, she's kind of been reduced a bit to certain aspects of her wardrobe. The rose headdress, the hui peel, the traditional Mexican dress, and the ethnic uh, jewelry. Um, but people have gone a little bit deeper as well to kind of think about her in terms of her pain and suffering, which I think comes very much across, not, not only in her clothing, but certainly in her canvases. Um, and so she's really been an inspiration for fashion designers um, throughout the last 20 to 30 or so years. Um, so here are some images of contemporary fashion inspired by Frida Kahlo's look. Um, and you'll see this is a John Paul Gaultier campaign from um, 1998, and he used not only the print imagery was kind of done in Frida Kahlo-esque style, but she, he actually kind of touched upon these various persona that she embodied through the actual garments as well, from the orthopedic corsets to her wearing um, and adorning of menswear, which we'll see, um, as well as kind of the more flamboyant um, traditional dress that she also wore. Um, other designers, I mean, it's really too numerous to even go through and mention because there are so many designers who have referenced Frida Kahlo in their work, but I can show you some here. Um, the upper left is Lena Hoschek, um, a German uh, designer from 2013. On the upper right is uh, Deepak Perwani, from, again from 2013. So some are quite uh, literal references to her look and her power as a visual icon, and some are a bit more kind of deeply rooted in who she was and the pain she experienced throughout her life, um, including on the lower left is an image of a dress by Ray Kawakubo for Comme des Garçons, which makes direct reference to some of these orthopedic corsets, which we'll see later. And then this is a collection by Ricardo Tichy for for Givenchy on the lower right, um, which um, again kind of gets a little bit more deeply into her um, kind of tortured soul in terms of the way he's interpreting the garments. 
And so where does all of this stem from? Um, if we look back to about 1983, um, there was a very seminal biography written by Hayden Herrera, um, which you see on the left. This biography has really formed the core of most of the information that circulates about Frida, as well as a lot of the kind of mythology surrounding her, and some of the stories that we'll kind of hear throughout my presentation. Um, and then there was a movie made in 1983, same time, by a Mexican uh, filmmaker called, um, or French, Frida Nature Vivante, or uh, Still Life. And then I think many of you are probably more familiar with the 2002 uh, biopic um, with Selma Hayek, which was hugely popular. And they took that moment to relaunch the biography. And um, instead of putting the image of Frida on the cover of the biography, they put Selma Hayek instead. <laughs> so they actually, I mean, there's this complete kind of co-opting of her look in this, which I think is quite... Amazing, and this really, all of this has really cemented her fame as a fashion and uh, pop culture icon. But what is really at the core of all of this? I want to delve in more deeply today and look at her more deeply and how she dressed herself and presented herself to the public. So, um, oh, let me just go, oh, sorry, I think. Oh, here it is. Sorry, I have it a little mixed up. But anyway, this is uh, Frida t uh, in a photograph taken by Nicholas Murray, who's a Hungarian-born photographer who lived in New York City. She had a decade-long affair with him. And he took some of the most compelling and beautiful color photographs of her in her lifetime. And you'll see a number of them sprinkled throughout the talk. Um, and Frida once said, I am my own muse. I am the subject I know best. I am the subject I want to know better. Um, and the complexity of Frida as an individual actually makes it extremely hard to, to kind of think about how to organize a talk because she's a remarkably complex individual um, and it's a remarkably rich subject. So throughout all of this, you'll see that she is a study in contrast. She is bicultural, biracial, bisexual, handicapped, an artist, a communist, her paintings addressed infertility, abortion, illness, sexuality, gender equality, miscarriage, pain, and heartbreak. Um, she smoked cigarettes, she drank tequila, yet she wore the French um, perfume Shalimar, and she loved uh, bright red lipstick. Um, she doesn't fit into a type, and so that's what makes it a bit more challenging to think about how to organize the talk. So, um, so what I want to do is explore the roots of Frida as a visual icon, and how her self-fashioning and this image she projected really feeds into her current obsession with her. Um, so if we go back, um, the way I've organized the talk is to deconstruct Frida into three different persona that all overlap and intermingle, and you'll see how that comes together at the end. But um, we're going to look at her as first on the left as a chica moderna. Um, Frida has come of age in the 1920s in Mexico City, a vibrant cosmopolitan city, and she's very much a part of 1920s culture and the era, she really grows up in the era of the flapper. Um, and she's really part of this moment of contemporary standards before she starts dressing more fully in Mexican garb. Um, secondly, we'll look at Frida in the middle as a mestiza. Um, this is really related to her allegiance and manipulation of her mixed heritage. So mestiza means a mix of European and Mexican Indian heritage. Um, and this is very much, it's very important to her and has a political agenda as well as an artistic one for her. Thirdly, we'll look at um, Frida and how all of this coalesces into her work as an artist. Um, so through her diary and her clothing, um, both of which, um, the diary was recently um, translated into English, it's available in the shop, it's really fascinating. Um, and her wardrobe was only opened in 2004. So her wardrobe was locked away after her death and Diego insisted that it be locked up for 50 years. So it was only in 2004 that we actually gained access to the, act, the real clothes and garments. And those open up a much more fuller and deeper understanding of Frida as a person and as an artist as well. So to begin, we will look at Frida as a, oops, uh, Chica Moderna, Oops, there we go. Um, so Frida was born in 1907 in a village called Coyoacan on the outskirts of Mexico City, but most of her life was spent in Mexico City, um, and here she is at the age of 10. Um, she grew up in a cosmopolitan environment in a middle-class um, bourgeois household. Mexico City at the time 
was a vibrant cultural cosmopolitan place. Um, and she's really growing. 19, in 1910, the Mexican Revolution had occurred. This, of course, affected life on all levels in Mexico. But there, and there was this incredible energy and dynamism to life in Mexico City in the 1920s, um, certainly. Um, and so Mexico City you know, it was vibrant, it was um, cross-cultural, there were people of many different um, ethnic backgrounds all mixing in here. Um, it was, it had movie, you know, movie theaters, it had department stores. Um, this is an early image, uh, about 1900, department stores in Mexico City. Um, uh, high fashion uh, styles were co being copied from France as early as the early 1800s in Mexico City. So it really is this kind of cross-cultural blending and mixing of influences um, that kind of begin in the Spanish colonial era and certainly continue throughout, um, throughout the 20th century. Uh, so here's an image of one of the department stores in Mexico City. By around uh, 1900, there were actually five huge department stores in Mexico City that were bringing in goods from all over the world. So you're exposed to all sorts of things. Um, there were fashion plates and fashion magazines that were being circulated on a regular basis starting in the 19th century as well. So Frida is really kind of privy to all of this. And when we think about the kind of imagery that was circulating at the time, we have to think about film. Frida was an avid film goer. She loved going to the movies. Um, she is really one of this new generation of women who could now express themselves sartorially and visually. And much has been written about her change in persona and her style as being attributed to Diego's kind of push for her to take on this traditional Mexican dress. Um, but there really is real personal expression here and there really is um, this kind of response to what is happening and what is out there in the cultural zeitgeist right now. So here we have an image of um, a, a movie star of the 1920s putting on makeup. This idea of putting on makeup was quite new in the 1920s and had actually become acceptable at this stage. 19, before 1900, this was not acceptable unless you were somebody from the theater or somebody from questionable background. Um, so putting on makeup, um, wearing this kind of flapper style garb, which was much freer, it liberated the body, there was no corset underneath it, so everything was very much about youthful movement and energy and dynamism. Um, and there was also this idea that you could try on a persona through dress. Um, and this again is a new concept in the 19 teens and 1920s, and this idea that a woman can be in control of her own image making is something that is quite novel and new, but is something that is really embraced in the 1920s. Um, and here we have two very famous Mexican film stars who left Mexico and then um, became quite famous in Hollywood. One is Dolores Del Rio and one is Lupe Velez. And you can kind of see these two different types of um, cults of personality that are expressed in film and through various media in that era. So Dolores Del Rio on the left is your prototypical flapper. She has on the loose shift, she has on, she has bobbed hair, she has that cloche hat. Um, and Lupi Velez is the prototypical vamp. So she is wearing this kind of exotic garb, she has the dark eyes, um, she has this kind of unidentifiable kind of gypsy dress on as well. Um, and if we look at two more images of them, here, again, Dolores Del Rio and Lupi Velez on the right. Uh, Dolores um, Del Rio is wearing the typical flapper's dress. So if you know, it's really basically a tube. Um, a lot of skin is showing. This is also something that's quite new and novel in the 1920s. So she has bare arms, the loose construction. Um, and then Lupi Velez, I love this image. She's very kind of casually posed. She's very um, confident. She's very assertive. She's wearing this Asian-inspired robe, and she's smoking a cigarette. And so, again, when we think about women's freedoms and what they were allowed to do that they hadn't been doing prior to 1900, smoking and drinking and socializing outside of um, the household was also something that was a relatively new development. So how did this translate to Mexico City? Um, on the right are, uh, is an image of two flappers, or flapperistas as they were called in Mexico, um, <laughs> from 1928. And you see they're wearing, again, kind of the typical 
a flapper dress. They both have bobbed hair. Um, on the left is an image from a, a magazine that was circulating in Mexico, and it shows Las Mujeres Modernas. And so you see, again, kind of a lot of the bare skin, um, but a lot of the confidence in, in kind of uh, assuredness in their, their own sexuality. Um, and I love the image on the lower left of this woman in the bathing suit. And she has this plane that's kind of this large scale plane across the body of the bathing suit. Because again, this idea of kind of energy and movement and the quickened pace of life was very much tied in to this idea of this modern woman. Um, and so what about Frida? So here we have an image of Frida that was taken in the 1920s, um, I, yeah, by her father, um, who was a studio photographer. Uh, and these are some of her friends. She is in the middle, and then her sister Christina is on the right-hand side. Um, so you'll see she has the bobbed hair, and she has actually a much more severe version of bobbed hair. It's called a shingle bob um, in the middle. And then her sister Christina has the bobbed hair as well, and it's a slightly more feminized look. She has the curl. It's a it has a little bit of a cap to it. Um, but, I mean, class and race really did determine styles of dress at this moment, hairstyles as well as public behavior. And it was really considered quite advanced for young bourgeois women to wear these short styles and to cut their hair. That was quite dramatic in the 1920s. Um, a mestiza or a real indigenous working woman would never do this. Um, a bourgeois woman from Mexico, Mexico City, however, would respond to this trend and she would actually participate in that and could be a flapperista. Um, and here is another image of Frida Kahlo, again, taken by her father when she's only 18 years old. Um, she has that quite severe hair, hairstyle, but again, this was actually very common. I mean, it was not unusual for women to cut their hair in this way. Um, and here's another image of her a little bit later, but with um, Tina Madotti, the photographer, and Frida Kahlo on the right. Um, again, just kind of showing that they were really adapting to what was then currently fashionable clothing. But Frida also dressed like this. So um, you see her on the far left, um, and there is kind of this great scene in the movie, the Selma Hayek movie, where the family is all gathering for their family portrait, and they're waiting for Frida, and she comes running out, and she's wearing a man's suit, and everybody, you know, her father just rolls his eyes, and he takes the picture. Um, but, but this, you know, even though it seems somewhat revolutionary to us to see her dressed in this men's suit within the context of this picture, and I'm sure it did raise some eyebrows, um, it was not unusual for women to, women were really starting to, to take on um, the wearing of men's garments and male styled tailored garments in the 1920s. And it was really an indication of these new freedoms and this new emancipation that they were experiencing. Um, so this is a little brochure um, from a firm called O'Rossin. And this is actually in the MFA collection. And they were one of these firms in France who really promoted this garçon or the boy-ish look um, that kind of really did have its roots in France and traveled, you know, and really did kind of spread quite widely throughout um, the world, really. Um, and there's another image here of Frida, um, again, when she was quite young, um, with, she still, you can see exactly how short that bob is, um, and just compared with some of these other flappers, I think this image is from London, um, with this woman, very, very kind of, again, the severe haircut and man-style tuxedo ensemble right there. Um, one thing to bear in mind is that Frida also was quite, um, she was quite, uh, you know, she was a kind of a frisky young girl, and uh, she was known as such. And she um, was part of this group called Las Cachucas, and excuse my Spanish, which is not very good, uh, or the Caps at school. And they actually would wear denim clothes, they would wear the, the kind of garments of the workers or the proletariat, and it was their statement, they're kind of thumbing their nose at authority. Um, and so she was one of that kind of group at school as well. So this was another way she expressed herself, and I think it all kind of melds together in a really interesting way. Um, oh, and then I just wanted to also um, talk a little bit about, again, kind of more generally about what's happening in the 1920s. I don't know if you know the novel Orlando by Virginia Woolf, and that novel is actually about um, the main character who changes sexes throughout the 
throughout the novel, again, 1920s, and she travels through time, changing her gender. Um, and Wolfe has one of my favorite quotes, I think, in terms of uh, when we think about what clothes actually mean to us and what I think that clothes certainly meant to Frida Kahlo. And so I'll read this. Uh, Vain trifles as they seem, clothes have, they say, more important offices than merely to keep us warm. They change our view of the world and the world's view of us. There is much to support the view that clothes wear us and we not them, and not we them. We may make them take the mold of arm or breast, but they mold our hearts, our brains, our tongues to their liking. So again, this is like when we think about the 20s and we think about what people are grappling with in terms of expressing themselves through dress, this is a relatively new concept, but it's something that Frida certainly wholeheartedly embraced. And she really was a chica moderna herself, and she was always very mindful of the significance and the power of clothing. So now we're going to go on to Frida as a mestiza, or a mixed, um, a woman of mixed heritage. Excuse me. So here's an image of um, one of her paintings. It's called Las Dos Fridas. It's from 1939. And it shows Frida um, wearing both European dress on the left and um, Mexican indigenous dress on the right. So that is a very typical Tejuana style garment, which we'll talk about a little more in a minute. Um, and I think that what you see here is that there's this very, um, as I mentioned, um, I don't know if, oh, maybe I didn't mention, her father is from Germany. He's of German and Hungarian descent. Her mother is of Mexican and Indian descent. Um, and so her ver she has a very modern sense of herself image and she is you know kind of intentionally mixing the two and grappling with the two and you'll see throughout my presentation that she actually does mix it all up throughout her kind of self presentation um, so she not only wears uh, garments from these uh, quote unquote peasant classes but she also kind of mixes it together with um, clothing of the middle or upper classes as well um, so we think of this typical Mexican dress, when we think about images of Frida, we think of this as being very uniquely Frida. Um, and of course, it's not uniquely Frida, it's just that her way of combining the looks was quite unique. But I want to go back in time slightly and kind of look at the roots of this look and this idea of what is typical Mexican indigenous dress. So I'm going to go forward and have, we'll have a look at a figure called the China Poblana. Um, which you see here. Um, China Poblana is, was a 19th century belle who was a mix of European and Indian blood. Um, and what's interesting about the China Poblana and her style is that it, again, kind of brought all these different influences together in one garment. So um, there's, when we think about uh, Spanish colonial expansion and the colonial inhabitants, it was, they were actually clothed in finest silks from China, for example, if you were of a certain class. All classes in colonial Mexico dressed in some sort of fabrics from Asia, including the Indian population, who were dressed in cottons from India. Um, and then it just kind of varied in degree of fineness. So the finer silks would be reserved for upper, upper classes, and um, the, uh, while the Creoles, um, while the Indian population might have the cotton rather than the finest silks from China. But what's really interesting, and I think if you saw Dennis Carr's excellent exhibition uh, made in the Americas, The New World Discovers Asia, you'll know that there was so much Asian influence within Mexico at this time, and that's what this kind of really represents. So China refers to anyone of Asian descent. Um, it also often kind of was mostly uh, specifically associated with a maid or a servant girl, and a poblana is a person from Puebla. Um, and they would wear European petticoats, colorfully embroidered Spanish-style blouses. They would be adorned with lace, sequins, other embellishments. They would wear this ubiquitous shawl or the rebozo, which is you see in green here and in a red here. Um, and the rebozo we'll talk about a little bit more because this really becomes a very standard um, piece of the wardrobe moving forward even into the current day. Um, the images and literary accounts abound of these 20th, of these China Poblanas. 
and um, Richard Henry Dana in two years before the mast, he wrote this in 1840, um, and he was quite taken with the styles of the women of Monterey, which was then still part of Mexico rather than California. And he wrote, the fondness of dress among the women is excessive and is often the ruin of many of them. A present of a fine mantle or of a necklace or a pair of earrings brings favor to the greater part of them. Nothing is more common than to see a woman living in a house of only two rooms, and the ground for a floor, dressed in spangled satin shoes, a silk gown, a high comb, <laughs> and gilt, if not gold, earrings or necklace. Um, and they actually would go on board ship and purchase more of this kind of embellishment to, to further embellish their, their garments. Um, so I'll show you a couple more. These are Tuchina Poblana. They were called the female dandies because they were so interested in their self-presentation. Um, and so this is um, from 1909. It's a postcard from 1909. And this is an actual Chena Poblana ensemble from the Rhode Island School of Design Museum. Um, and so again, it becomes this emblematic, romanticized look for Mexican indigenous costume. It's eventually replaced by the Tijuana, Tijuana look, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, this overall adornment, the long skirts, the jewelry, and the shawl, the rebozo, become a signifier of this particular style. Um, so this rebozo that we see, um, they all wear, but the one on the right, I'll talk about briefly. So the rebozo was a head covering or shawl. Um, that really completed the Chena Poblana's ensemble. And it was an important accessory for women of all social classes. So the usage can be traced back to the colonial era in Mexico. Um, and they sometimes used an embroidered Chinese um, crepe shawl that came from the Manila trade. But the actual origins are lost. People have not been able to specifically identify where the rebozo has come from. But it really is in and of itself is a mestizo. It's this mixing of Asian influences. So it combines the Philippine sarong, um, it combines elements of Hindu textiles um, with Spanish, because the fringe actually comes from a manila shawl, and pre-Hispanic ones. Um, it's a multi-purpose uh, textile, and it's usually about 33 yards wide and about two yards in length, so pretty substantial. Um, and it's ecot woven in either cotton or silk. And ecot weaving means that the warp and the weft are dyed before they go on the loom, and then the wheat, they're woven together, and that actually creates the pattern. So um, an ecot, ecot weaving is um, a highly valued uh, type of weaving. So they would have a lot of intrinsic value as well. Um, and one thing about another aspect of the Chena Poblana that I think is really important to Frida and her kind of taking on of this um, indigenous Mexican look is that they are often portrayed as being free from the restraints imposed upon women from fashionable society. So they can dress as boldly as they pleased. There was no corsetry. There was nothing confining about this look. Um, so, and I think that that also has kind of great appeal to certainly um, the women wearing it, but also this idea of the Chena Poblana as it kind of filtered out uh, to the West. Um, so, so what does this mean for Frida? Um, so, the look that we normally associate with Frida is actually what is called the Tejuana look. Um, and this really does become the look for Mexican garb even today. Um, so the Mexican Revolution of 1910 led to this real fervent embracing of Mexico's indigenous and mestizo past. And the revolutionary agenda actually was used to construct and celebrate the ancient indigenous and folk craft of Mexico. And that's really the aspect of it, I think, that appealed to Frida on many levels. So here you see Frida wearing this Tejuana dress. This is an exhibition from the Royal Ontario Museum that was just up um, about a year or so ago that's showing Tejuana dress in various guises, so modern as, as well as kind of more classic or, or older styles. And then the map on the bottom shows you where it kind of comes from. It's the Tejuana um, Isthmus, which is kind of smack dab in the middle of um, central South Mexico, and Mexico City is right in the middle there. Um, so uh, Frida loved Mexican craft and folk art, um, and I also think that the attraction to Tejuana dress could also have something to do with the fact that women of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec managed to sustain this matriarchal structure 
and women could actually hold high rank in econ economic and political positions. And so it's this culture that kind of resisted European patriarchal um, organization, and I think that had, you know, probably had some great appeal as well. Um, the other thing that's quite fascinating about the look is that it often includes these astral and cosmic symbols related to mi mixed with myths of creation. And they always put woman at the center because she is the creative, she is the creator of life. So symbols of fertility, they often have um, imagery of the sun that's incorporated into the look. And then these incredible headdresses, which actually you'll see in another image, where it forms like the sun rays around the face. And so again, it's kind of placing women at the center of all of this, um, you know, kind of as a fertility symbol, as the, as the, as the creator. Um, so, Frida starts kind of creating and uh, self-fashioning, the self-fashioning related to her Mexican heritage during the first years of her marriage to Diego Rivera. Um, so, when she got married to Diego in 1929, one of her parents said, it was as if an elephant had married a dove. Uh, which is kind of not so kind, but, um, but he was over six feet tall and he weighed over 300 pounds. Frida was just over five feet and weighed 100 pounds, so extremely petite. Um, but their love and their passion for one another and their devotion lasted throughout their lives. I mean, it's really incredible. When you read his um, autobiography and her diary, you can see that the passion was so deep and so profound, um, even though they you know, were, had affairs with numerous other people while they were married. Um, Rivera wrote, I was lucky enough to love the most wonderful woman I know. She was poetry itself and genius itself. Um, so it, it really is this deep-rooted passion. They also came together politically. They were very much on the same page with um, their communist beliefs as well. Um, and a lot of people speculate that this dress, and there's this story that has kind of been perpetuated because of this Hayden Herrera biography that she borrowed the dress from one of her maids or one of the household servants to wear for her wedding, um, which I have found absolutely no evidence for. And actually, in looking at the dress, I'm pretty sure that that is not the situation. <laughs> so um, if we look at, uh, this is our fantastic new, relatively new acquisition of Dos Mujeres, which is upstairs in the American wing and making modern. Um, and this is an image of the household help. So she used um, two maids in the, the Kahlo household as models. So she's elevating kind of the working class um, in doing this. But look at their clothing. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. Of course, if you're working um, in a household, you're not going to be wearing anything too uh, flamboyant or, or um, fancy. Um, but if we look back um, at Frida's dress, uh, and you look at what would normally be worn for a wedding, it's not a normal wedding dress. I mean, that much is, is quite clear. Um, so um, this is an image of a painting that she painted in 1936 that's called My Parents, My Grandparents, and Me. And so here's the little Frida down there, her parents above her, and her two sets of grandparents above. And they're all kind of interconnected with this ribbon slash umbilical cord. Um, but her mother is in her wedding dress, I believe. And that is a very typical, what would be perceived as a very typical high fashion wedding gown of probably the 1890s or so. Um, and you look at what Frida's wearing, and I'm sure by 1929, you know, women are certainly still, you know, are, are donning these very kind of more formal uh, white wedding dresses. Um, and it's interesting because a contemporary newspaper description where they published this image, one of these images, corroborates the idea that this is not a normal wedding dress. It, it was, um, published in La Prensa in August, on August 23rd in 1929, and it comments in the article accompanying it that she's wearing very simple street clothes. Um, so that was considered quite unusual for the time. So she's certainly asserting her individuality. There's no doubt about that. Um, but, and she's also asserting her individuality by not letting go of her cigarette. I don't know if you notice that she's holding a cigarette in her hand um, for her portrait. She's also lost an earring, which is kind of interesting. Um, but, but I, you know, I was looking at this garment and I thought, you know, what is going on with this dress? Because it's, it's not 
like much that I have seen. It is definitely not an indigenous garment. Um, it's something that was probably a country or day dress made by a local seamstress. Um, cotton was certainly being imported from abroad at this point in the 19th century. Cotton was being imported from Manchester, England into Mexico. Um, and that was replaced by local manufacturers in the 1930s. But I looked at this textile pattern and I saw modernist textiles from Europe um, and other parts of the world. And so if you look at this image, you'll see the two top textiles are Soviet textiles from the 1920s and 30s. They have a very similar kind of pattern to them. The one on the lower left is a Wiener Werkstätter um, textile, the Austrian workshops, um, designed by Joseph Hoffmann in the late 1920s. Um, and then this one on the right, this is actually a design that's in the museum collection, and it is a design from Mallinson Silk Company, which was an American silk company that looked to indigenous um, design patterns for their own line of silks. Um, so it's very much in line with these contemporary textiles that are coming out of Europe. And I think what it is, it's a cotton that was made into this dress um, by a local seamstress. So now if we move forward and um, we look at the colorized version of this portrait. Um, so here you see she lost the cigarette, she refound the earring, which is, <laughs> which is good. Um, but I wanted to point out, so we don't really know what color it is. I think actually the rebozo that she has draped around her neck was probably a different color. So I don't think that the color is, it may not be true because in hand-tinted um, color photographs, the tinting comes after the photo. So whether or not it's related to the reality is really hard to, hard to know. Um, but this is a really wonderful little um, colorized version of their wedding portrait that was actually a gift to Jackson Cole Phillips, um, who was the owner of the Frida portrait um, that's upstairs in Making Modern. So this photograph is up there, so I'd encourage you to go look at it a little more closely. But this is the more formal wedding photo. Um, and then if we look at how Frida chose to depict herself a couple years later as her own painted wedding portrait, you'll see that she has changed quite a bit. So the, the dress is very different. The dress is more in line with this Tawana um, style of dress, the broad skirt, um, the vibrant coloration. She, if you look at the, um, the photograph, you'll see she's wearing very fashionable satin slippers with rhinestone buckles. And in this portrait, she has completely changed them to horaches or the sandals, the, the Mexican indigenous sandals. Um, she's changed her jewelry. I actually looked at this image kind of closely with our jewelry curator, Emily. We were trying to figure out, it almost looks like she has pearls on in the in the photograph, um, whereas she's kind of changed some of it to, she's wearing um, maybe jade beads or something to that effect, something that's more related to Mexico's past. She also has changed her hairstyle so that she's wearing this very distinctive um, twisted ribbon-like uh, band in her hair that again is very much, very typical for Tijuana dress. So she's using this portrait to portray her Mexi Mexicanidad or her Mexican cultural identity as well as her socialist political beliefs. So she's using this Tijuana kind of woman, um, which is an iconic figure for Mexico even today, to kind of bring all of that out and communicate that. And I think it, for her it kind of represents strength um, as well as sensuality. Um, and then her favorite rebozo is actually, this looks red in the portrait, but there is evidence that it was one of her favorite rebozos, and it was actually a vibrant magenta pink, we'll see it a little later in the presentation, and interestingly is made out of rayon. So when we think of <laughs> these, um, this kind of mixing, I mean, there's always these contradictions here in this mixing of the ancient and the modern and the, the new and the old. I mean, it's all kind of wrapped up in many of these portraits. And then, um, again, there's always these contradictions when you're dealing with Frida. Um, she wrote at one time that, in another era of my life, I dressed as a boy. Pants, boots, jacket. But when I went to see Diego, I wore a Tijuana outfit. I've never been to Tehuantepec. I have no relationship with its people. But among all Mexican dress, the Tijuana costume is my favorite, and that is why I dress like a Tijuana. So for her, I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly how much of that is rooted in, in truth, but 
you can tell part of it is a visual impulse as well as kind of a statement of her political beliefs as well. Um, and here you see an image of her actually much more casually dressed at home at La Casa Azul, the blue house, which was her home. Um, and she's wearing these silk um, and linen pajamas, Chinese pajamas, that she probably purchased in San Francisco. Um, and then you see her depicted here in a mural by Diego Rivera called El Arsenal um, of 1928. And she's wearing you know, the, the kind of working outfit of the proletariat. Um, she has her man-styled hair, and she's handing out guns to um, the revolutionaries. Um, but I think that by the 1930s, certainly, Frida has embraced this idea of um, taking on her mestizo past, mestizo past, as well as her, um, you know, this interest in wearing Tijuana garb. Um, so in 1930, she took a trip to San Francisco. And this is a photograph by Edward Weston, who photographed her and Diego when they came to San Francisco in 1930. Um, and he wrote, I photographed Diego again, his new wife, Frida, too. She is in sharp contrast to Lupe, who was Rivera's second wife. Uh, petite, a little doll alongside Diego, but a doll in size only, for she is strong and quite beautiful. She shows very little of her father's German blood. Dressed in native costume, even to the horaches, or sandals, she causes much excitement on the streets of San Francisco. People stop in their tracks to look in wonder. Um, and according to Rivera's biographer, their trip to America, there were parties everywhere, streams of invitations to tea, dinners, weekends, and lectures with great audiences, all coming to get a glimpse of this couple because she had such a striking and dramatic um, you know, visual persona. And it's really um, quite interesting because I think that she, of course, realizes that and takes it on, and this becomes kind of her standard look. Um, so, and here um, she is in this really beautiful picture by Edward Weston, taken at the time of her trip to San Francisco. And again, it's this real mashup of styles and influences. So she has a long skirt and shirt on. She has these huge jadeite beads, again, that were used by the Aztecs for sculpture. Um, and yet the Rebozo now is a European shawl, European a shawl of um, European origin. Um, and so here is an image, a uh, uh, painting that she painted, um, which is called Self-Portrait on the Border of US and Mexico. And she was often kind of grappling with her relationship um, with the United States. Um, she had been there by 1933 when this had been painted. And there's really a conflict here. Um, so she's looking at the progress of um, industry. You see Ford, kind of F-O-R-D, on those smokestacks back there. And America is really depicted as this um, kind of, it's you know, really about progress and industry. Um, and it's contrasted with the ancient traditions of Mexico. And so you see the roots and you see the flowers and they've been replaced by these turbines and these pipes and these smokestacks spewing smoke. Um, and it's interesting because she's straddling these two countries. And what has she chosen to wear but this pink, it's almost, it's kind of a muted dress for her. Um, and it, I, I feel like it represents this kind of uncertainty that she's grappling with in terms of being modern and also being an artist who, who has to sell her work in this capitalist economy and also stay true to her roots in Mexico. Um, so she's wearing this pink dress, she's wearing lace gloves, the um, necklaces are probably more indigenous in style. And again, she's um, smoking her cigarette, <laughs> not surprisingly. Um, but the colonial period also in Mexico kind of was marked by this idea of a mestizo culture. So it was both Indian and European. So there were two Mexicos kind of at the same time. And I think that that's what probably some of this dress ap actually represents. Um, this is, oh, and here, actually, I found this quite interesting. So here she is in 1933 in Chicago with Diego Rivera when he was painting one of his murals, and she's painting this painting. Um, and it's a beautiful image, and I just want to point out the heels on those shoes because <laughs> they are so high. Um, so anyway, again, it's, you know, she's kind of got this real mixture and blend of both the modern and the ancient. Um, 
And so this is the, the image that the title of the talk comes from. It's called My Dress Hangs There. And it's from 1933. It's another allegorical painting that's full of symbolism that I don't have time to go into all of it. But here she is, her dress is hanging in the middle of this New York City landscape. And she has chosen to use this Tejuana or traditional Mexican dress to represent her in the middle of New York City. It is not a positive view of, of Mexico, um, I mean of New York City. There are um, kind of workers all down here um, on the bottom of the of the canvas that are, I think, you know, certainly related to her communist um, beliefs. Um, she um, is hung, her dress is hung between a trophy and a toilet, you know, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but, um, but it's, it's this very conflicted relationship, as I mentioned, that she is an artist, she has to embrace this capitalist culture to some degree to sell her paintings, and she knows that this image of herself and her own um, self kind of fashioning are part and parcel of that, but she has removed herself from the actual dress. There's also a really interesting image on the upper left of Mae West, who is another kind of very assertive um, sexual uh, woman. It's kind of interesting that she's, she has included that as well. So her public image is certainly uh, gaining traction by the 1930s. In 1937, Vogue magazine does a spread um, on the Senoras of Mexico, and she is included. And it's really kind of interesting. She's one of about five or six women from Mexico City. Most of them are dressed in some form of indigenous clothing rather than high fashion. Um, and the point of the article is somewhat demeaning. Um, the whole article really talks about how refined the culture really is, and that society did exist there, and that they're surprisingly sophisticated. Um, and they actually give teas and they play golf. Like, this should be a surprise. <laughs> but, um, but here she is really presented as, the, as Senora Diego Rivera, the wife of the famous Mexican artist. So her first name is mentioned in the article, but it's not kind of mentioned um, in the caption to the image. Um, and they note that his studio is the mecca of foreign visitors who want to meet Diego and his beautiful wife in the quote unquote uh, native costumes she affects. Um, so this is actually though, it's a much more subtle, even for 1937, much more subtle kind of use of some of this indigenous dress. She has the white petticoat, she has the rebozo. Um, the shirt itself is a little bit more kind of straightforward. Um, but her, and I'll show you the color image here, um, which is a really lovely color image. Um, and you can see this is the color of her wedding shawl. That's that magenta rayon rebozo that she's wearing in that. Um, but she, um, she is affecting the braids of the Tejuana, the traditional Tejuana look. Um, so again, she's kind of doing a bit of a mestiza look here. Um, so, but you know, Kahlo also is not the only one who is thinking in terms of how to present herself as a Mexican artist who is very much rooted in these traditions. So this is an artist by the name of Maria Izquierdo, um, who um, posed, uh, who was a contemporary of Kahlo's and was actually more prominent in her lifetime than Frida Kahlo. Um, and she really lived rather than just represented Mexican femininity in many ways, but she depicted herself very much like Frida did in these kind of traditional uh, Mexican garb. She also was a surrealist artist as well, very much like uh, Frida herself. So she is not alone in this idea and this kind of mode of presentation. Oh, sorry. So there is a second article um, that came out in Vogue just the year later. I think maybe they found her to be such a fascinating subject, they decided to do an article just on Frida alone. So um, it's called Rise of Another Rivera, and it includes images of a lot of her paintings. Um, so here she is depicting herself um, as a Tejuana, although it does still say by the wife of the famous Mexican painter. But, but by 1938, she does kind of have more of a following. Um, and then I wanted to point to the image here, um, there, uh, this one, which is called Self-Portrait um, with a Heart, to get a little more closely at this and dissect it a little bit more. Um, 
And I, because I think that this image, this was painted in 1938, really captures this conflict she had with her clothing, with her body. Um, it's really evident here. So she has put herself in the middle in a very basic white shift. So the, the central dress is not of as much consequence. But she's flanked herself, again, kind of as a mestizo, she has flanked herself with her school uniform on the left, and then this Taiwana dress, which keeps resurfacing in a lot of these paintings on the right. Um, and then just to, I'm, I know a lot of you have been to many of the courses, so you probably know a lot about her health history, but if some of you haven't, I'm just gonna run through some of her health issues um, so that you're aware of really a lot of what she's depicting in this image. So Frida suffered from polio as a child, and so she had one lame leg and one that was slightly shorter and thinner than the other. And then at age 18, her, she was riding on a bus, and the bus collided with a tramway, and a metal handrail pierced her body, went through her left side, through her womb, and then perforated her vagina. Her spine, pelvis, collarbone, leg, foot, and ribs were all broken. And ironically, she was left bloodied and naked after the crash, but she was covered in gold dust because there had been an artisan traveling with a packet of gold dust on, on the train. So it's kind of this incredible, um, one of these, Carlos Fuentes really, he, he uses this phrase, terrible beauty, over and over again in his essay to the introduction of the diary, which is a fabulous essay if you buy the book. Um, and I think that that kind of captures that. Um, so she had 22 surgeries after the accident. Um, so much of her life was spent in pain, in bed, recovering. Um, it's, it's really quite quite awful. Um, and so here I think you get a sense for that, you get a sense for it in a lot of her imagery, but here you see her arms have been kind of disembodied. One is on one dress, one is on the other. The foot, the lame foot, um, has been turned into a sailboat that may eventually sail off, and it could be, this is 1938, a premonition, because she eventually had to have her foot amputated, and then uh, gradually her leg um, came off as well later in life. So um, it's this remarkably striking and um, poignant kind of imagery here. So this spear is, uh, is surmounted by two little angels on either end, and it pierces right through her heart, and then her heart is laying on the beach, and then she has tears streaming down her face. So um, it's really, you know, her body is certainly broken, and it's certainly something that she addresses over and over in her art, but also the clothing, of course, um, helps her cover that up. So when you think about the kind of ensembles they are, they really do um, the long skirts, the boxy wheepiel blouse. It helps to cover the corsetry, the orthopedics. Um, it is something that really suits what her physical condition is. Um, so, and uh, you know, as I mentioned before, a lot of scholars talk about um, Diego as kind of, a you know, kind of um, encouraging her to wear this Taiwan dress, which she certainly did, and it's certainly true. Um, but she really does kind of take it on and embrace it and make it her own, very specifically Frida style. And this is an image of a uh, painting called um, Self Portrait as, as Taiwana, or Diego on My Mind from 1943, where she has kind of fully embraced this idea of herself as a Taiwana. And then I think it's quite symbolic that she has put Diego <laughs> front and center on her forehead, I think probably showing um, her allegiance not only to him, but also to this idea that he has promoted uh, this kind of taking on of the Tewana style. Um, and this is the actual headdress that is in the Casa Azul, the Museum Frida Kahlo ex um, in Mexico City, um, which is quite beautiful and has survived and was locked away in that wardrobe. Um, and so you see it's actually a very remarkably um, similar likeness um, to it. And then this is a really lovely, um, so a uh, picture of Frida Kahlo um, that is by, it's called Classic Frida by Nicholas Murray, again this Hungarian photographer from New York City from 1939 that's in the MFA collection. It's a really beautiful and I think thoughtful image of Frida. Um, and interestingly, I was reading that um, Second Vogue article and at the end it says, 
Madame Rivera seems herself a product of her art, and like all her work, one that is instinctively and calculatedly well composed. It is also expressive, expressive of a gay, passionate, witty, and tender personality, which I think is really quite spot on in many ways, because they were very, you know, this writer was very much aware that she was kind of, you know, calculatedly forming this image of herself. And so now we're going to move forward and look at Frida the artist through her clothing, through the actual garments, and through the words of her diary. Um, and I kind of loosely titled this section, Dressing for Paradise. Um, and here we have two really beautiful, beautiful images of Frida, again taken by Nicholas Murray. I think his images of her are some of the most beautiful out there, and some of the few really color images of her um, in all of her glory. Um, but what I think that Vogue uh, writer alluded to is that she can't really be extricated from her canvases. They're one and the same, and she really did create herself as a work of art. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is look at her diary. Um, the wardrobe story is quite fascinating. So when Frida died, um, uh, Diego Rivera said he wanted her wardrobe to be locked up for 50 years. So they took one bathroom of Casa Azul and a lot of her personal belongings, a lot of her more intimate items, and her wardrobe were all locked up for 50 years. And it was only in 2004 that they opened up this wardrobe. And it really has kind of allowed us to get a deeper and fuller understanding of Frida kind of as an individual and as an artist as well. So I'm going to show you some of the images of what they discovered in that wardrobe, as well as um, some of the images from her diary now. And to kind of like better understand how deeply her dress and her painting are really intertwined. Um, and so there is really um, this idea that she is co constructing a persona is pretty clear when you look at her diary and you look at her life. Um, she actually altered her birth date from 1907 to 1910 to correspond with the date of the Mexican Revolution. So there is this real you know, manipulation of image there. And then in her diary, she calls herself the ancient concealer. Um, so again, she's kind of referring to this idea that she is keeping some, I mean, you feel like so much of it is exposed. So much of her inner life and turmoil and pain are exposed. But she also is um, kind of specifically constructing that. Um, the other thing that I find really amazing about her is that it's this really passionate embrace of life while confronting death on a regular basis. Um, so the surrealist artist Andre Breton called her artwork a ribbon around a bombshell because there's beauty and pain and suffering all wrapped up into one. And her diaries are really are replete with images of the yin and yang symbol. So she's very much aware of this kind of, um, you know, kind of... Uh, dichotomy of life. Um, and what I thought was very interesting and very compelling is that she called her clothing dressing for paradise. So in a way, a lot of what she was doing was preparing herself for death um, because it was very much a part of what she was confronting with on a regular basis. And if we look at the imagery and some of the images um, that she painted, um, Diego also encouraged her to use this retablo or ex voto form for the basis for her paintings. And um, these ex votos are usually these kind of modest paintings painted on tin. And it's this intimate painting that translated pain into art. And it tells a story. So you see one on the left. It's usually depicts an accident or a tragedy that has been overcome. And so this is kind of the offering after the tragedy has been overcome. It's a miracle. And so she does kind of use that form in her own paintings because she is dealing with so much pain and suffering herself. From 1944 onward, I mentioned that she had her foot um, amputated because of gangrene, eventually her leg, um, and then she had to wear a series of eight different corsets over the course of this kind of um, dealing with how to address her spinal issues after her spine was broken, because she couldn't actually support herself. The spine wouldn't support her body. She suffered miscarriages. Um, you know, it goes kind of on and on. Um, and here is Casa Azul. And so as I mentioned, when she died at age 47, Diego began putting all of her personal effects into this bathroom. Um, and the house became the Museo Frida Kahlo. Um, and they sealed up the room. 
um, until 2004. And in the um, book about the opening of Frida Kahlo's wardrobe, it's called Self-Portrait in a Velvet Dress, um, the director of the Frida Kahlo Museum um, writes about opening it. And it says, the lock securing the door was removed. Even though we knew what awaited, with us, awaited us, it was a very emotional experience to step into this space that had lain undisturbed for so many years. Inside, a strong smell, half acrid, half sweet, pervaded the air, a mixture of dampness, medicines, dust, and time. And one of the first things they saw were these orthopedics um, that you see here in the bathtub. Um, and then this is some other imagery of kind of what they encountered when they unlocked the door. Um, and he writes, we were dazzled. It was wonderful to behold the wide variety of clothing inside, Chinese and Indian fabrics embroidered by Tawana hands. Um, so as well as some of her personal effects, her makeup, her Pons cream, um, some of the medications that she took were actually still there, locked up after 50 years. So it was really like the unlocking of a time capsule. Um, the museum was finally able to catalog and organize the bathroom contents, including her, it included clothing, jewelry, prostheses, um, 300 pieces in total, um, garments from Mexico, Guatemala, China, handmade blouses and skirts made by local seamstresses, some garments from the Europe and the US, um, and again, everything eclectic, no one style. There was no one complete Tawana ensemble. It was all kind of mixed together. This is an image of the exhibition at the Casa Azul, and you can just see kind of the great variety, the beauty, and the color of this. Um, and interestingly, again, when we think about this mixing of ancient and modern, this was one of the dresses they found, and this is um, a dress that is, again, made out of black rayon, and it has industrial embroidery as well as gold rickrack embroidered onto it. So again, kind of having access to these very modern pieces as well as the ancient. Um, the, the diary is a really amazing read. It's really kind of this surrealistic, almost automatic writing in style when you read it. So it's really stream of consciousness. It's all sorts of ideas and thoughts kind of flowing through the journal. Um, one thing I found really fascinating about it is this page in particular, that's the cover, and this is a page that's on the symbolism of color. And so she was thinking very consciously about um, what color meant and which colors she would use and which she would wear. So um, this is the imagery related to color, and it says green equals a good warm light. Diego's eyes are green, and she mentions the depth of his color of his eyes and how she tries to kind of immerse herself in them. And she thinks of green as nurturing and life-giving as well. Um, and here we see one of the classic images of Frida kind of surrounded by this green. Magenta um, was the, uh, she thinks of as an Aztec color, the color of the prickly, the blood of the prickly pear, and is one of the brightest and oldest colors, and you think about her magenta rebozo, that was one of her favorites. Um, she talks about the color of mole, which is you know that chocolate-based sauce that's used in Mexican cooking, as being leaves becoming earth. Um, and then she writes, nothing is black, really nothing. Um, and yellow to her is really sadness and madness and mystery. So yellow is not, even though she wears yellow, it's something that she has, again, kind of this conflicted um, relationship with. Oh, wait, let me go back. Um, but the other thing she writes that I think is really fascinating is that the caress of fabric, the color of colors, the wires, the nerves, the pencils, the cells, everything is him, Diego. So she actually likens the experience of wearing such beautiful fabrics to the sensual nature of love. Um, and she has this real predilection from, you know, kind of mostly natural fibers that are really soft to touch. And so I think that it's the sensual act of putting on those garments, which I'm sure were kind of a salve to the broken body underneath, that was also quite important to her. Um, and she kind of talks about Diego as one who captures color, as she calls him an oxychrome, whereas a chromophore is her role, which is the giver of color. And so you know that this is a really important aspect of kind of not only her painting, but also her presentation of self. And it's full of all sorts of other amazing objects. Um, this, again, is one of the corsets she had to wear um, when she was trying to heal from um, the spinal 
injuries um, and what she was grappling with with more surgery. And she, again, adorns almost everything in her life. It's really fascinating to look at. Um, this one actually has mirrors that have been embedded in the corset. And then, of course, it has the hammer and sickle, which is a communist um, symbol. Um, this is another corset, one of the most kind of vividly decorated ones that almost, it has kind of this aquatic uh, scene on it, but also could be, you know, kind of portray veins. There's an eye there, um, really quite amazing. And there's a really, um, at one point they brought in a Japanese photographer to document all of these objects. Um, his name is... Uh, is um, Isiuchi Miyako, um, who, photo who did a lot of this photography and kind of did these really beautiful and I think uh, compelling, visually compelling images of some of these objects that have been left. Um, her shoes, of course, tell quite a story. So these are shoes that you can see the difference in the height of her legs. Um, and then also, I love, they found a number of Chinese textiles in the wardrobe. And so she adorns her shoes with these Chinese dragons on the side, which I think is quite interesting. And this is another um, image of one of her prosthetics after she had the leg amputated. And again, she again kind of adorns it. So she, it's kind of incredible how she really um, feels the need to adorn kind of every aspect of her life. It is very much um, kind of part of her being, I think, in many ways. Also, um, there was some makeup left over. So uh, this is some of the um, nail polish that she wore. Um, she, we know that she always very carefully made up her face before she went out. So there's some Cody uh, rouge and powder. She used a Talika eye pencil on her brow. And often, I don't know if many of you know this, but she would actually darken that mono brow. So <laughs> it was really, again, kind of this very um, calculated, specific look that she was trying to achieve. And she had this very vibrant magenta lipstick as well. Um, these are some of the blouses, and these are Chena Poblana blouses. We talked about the Chena Poblana. These are two really spectacular embroidered Chena Poblana blouses um, that are in the collection. Um, that this one, um, the one on the bottom right in particular, is adorned with beads and really, really complex embroidery. Um, and here's yet another one of those kind of orthopedic corsets that she's adorned with another mirror on the top. Um, and I think that, again, kind of speaks to the pain and the suffering that she was really grappling with on a regular basis. Um, and again, you know, when we think about uh, kind of this image of Frida and how fascinating and she continues to be, um, you know, some people critique it as this commodification of her look and who she is. Um, and it's criticized as removing her real significance away from a lot of kind of the more subversive political, historical, and feminist content. And yet I think that there is this continued fascination is really um, this kind of visceral response to this woman who had such a vibrant and diverse and kind of amazing life. Um, and there, here are two images of, uh, again, this um, Nicholas Murray photograph that were taken and used on Vogue magazine um, fairly recently when the, um, the movie came out. Um, and then more recently, this is a singer named Natalia Lafourcade who is, who kind of very recently publicly came out and said she is only going to wear Mexican um, clothing, Mexican uh, clothing by Mexican designers, and she really wanted to connect back to her origins. And again, I think this is really kind of a direct homage to Frida in many ways because it was important to infusing her music with a more kind of authentic Mexican character. Um, so it, you know, her influence continues to kind of live on. So I'm just going to wrap up. This is an image from one of the images from her diary. Again, it's quite beautiful. Um, and she writes that, I used to think I was the strangest person in the world. But then I thought, there are so many people in the world. There must be somebody who, like me who feels bizarre and flawed in the same way as I do. I would imagine her and imagine that she must be out there thinking of me. Um, and what I think we kind of come away with is that there's nothing about Mexico and Mexico's history that's strictly linear or straightforward. It's very turbulent in terms of the history and the culture. It's, uh, Carlos Fuentes calls it a country made by its wounds. And I think that Frida's story is quite 
the same, is very similar. Um, but as a fashion icon, she really crossed boundaries of class, gender, urban and rural life, ancient tradition and modern modernity in a really fascinating way. And she had this remarkably vibrant life that simultaneously embraced life and death. Um, so she was a chica moderna, a mestiza, and an artist. And I think that this quote nicely sums up her vivacity, distinctiveness, and style. She wrote in her journal, feet, what do I need them for if I have wings to fly? Thank you. So I think we have time for questions, if anybody wants to ask anything. Thank you all for coming. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um, is it known if she was her own seamstress? Because she obviously had to adjust. You know, it's, I've, I have found a couple references to her making things, but I haven't, nothing definitive. But I, it does make me wonder. and. One of the things I kept meaning to do was, um, and I tried to kind of get in touch with the curator at Casa Azul um, before just to ask her that question, but I don't know. But I know that they used a lot of the local seamstresses too, but it does seem like with those shoes, for example, like, you know, that some of them are so crafted, like handcrafted, that I, I do wonder. I'm not really sure. I'd be interested to know though. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. I had read that in addition to the Tijuana look, yes. that she also used influences from other native mm -hmm. uh, Mexican groupies. Mm -hmm. is, did you find yes. that as well? Yeah, there is. I mean, I think that the Tijuana is um, kind of the most prevalent in her look, but yes, there are other indigenous, uh, you know, she, as I mentioned, she was a, an avid shopper, she was an avid collector. She collected a lot of folk art, um, of Mexican folk art as well. And I think that it, again, it wasn't you know one specific look. It never was one specific look. It always had a mix of all these kind of different influences. So, yeah, there are some other other things um, it, in the collection as well that are not just specifically Tijuana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, was it known why Diego decided to lock that room for 50 years and why he picked 50 as it's, the I know, frame? It's, it's very interesting. Nobody, the director doesn't write specifically about why. I mean, I think maybe it could be the intimacy of those objects, you know, because like clothing is so personal and so intimate. And I think that it was such a fret, and he died just a few years after her. So, I mean, even if he had intended to open it up earlier, it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't to be. But I think that he just, um, it may have been too difficult for him personally to kind of grapple with that. So I'm not really sure. And it, there, I don't know, I haven't read his whole autobiography, which he wrote with someone else, but I'm wondering if there may be a reference in there that might say something more about it, but I'm not sure. Um, she died at a very early age. Yes. With all of her health problems, what ultimately did she die from? Well, that's, there's a lot of speculation about that. Um, from what I can tell, when she had her leg amputated, that um, pulled her into a really deep depression. Um, and she had a lot of pain. Um, she was drinking heavily at the end of her life. She also was had morphine injections regularly because of the pain. And there is a lot of speculation that she committed suicide. She had a couple, she, there had been a couple of attempts on her own life prior to that. And so I think that may be in the end what, it hap what actually happened. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. How prolific was she in her art? How many pieces? How, how prolific? Yeah. Um, by the time she started writing the journal, I knew she, that was in 1944. 
she had about 100 paintings that she had painted at that stage. So, and then I think she continued, but it's interesting when you read the diary. It is so clear the physical um, decline of her body because you can see it gets more and more painful to write. Her drawings get more rough and simple. So um, I don't think she was doing as much after that point. So it's certainly about over 100. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Thank, Thank you, you all for coming. Thank you so I much appreciate for coming it. today. Thanks.